it's George Kroos with another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast, and I'm pumped to have my best friend, <laughs> Mandy Freilich here. And uh, Mandy and I were just having a great conversation before this all started. And Mandy actually is the first uh, person to actually be on the podcast in season one twice. And there's a reason I wanted um, her to be on uh, again so soon, and it's because she actually uh, introduced her, or just released her new book, Reignite the Flames, and something that I've actually been really enjoying reading, and I'll tell you, it's been pushing me, um, and it's making, I know it's, I don't know if this is your, your hope, but it's been um, making me feel a little bit uncomfortable, really thinking about kind of my own mental health, um, how engaged I am, and I think a lot of people right now are struggling with that, uh, and this part of the reason I wanted to have you back on because I know teachers are going back uh, to to school, and uh, you know there's a lot of stress with that, and understandably. But I actually, Manny, I got to tell you this before we start. I know I'm talking so much, but we're gonna get to you in a second. I was having the worst day ever the other day, and Manny just sent me this book, and I was just like, okay. Oh. And so I'm sitting here on phone with tech support, and then I read this. I read the dedication and at the end it says, and finally, thank you to George Crows, whose keynote book, Innovator's Mindset and Friendship were the catalyst for my own re-engagement. And I just started crying. And <laughs> yeah. So I, I think like, I, I don't know, I don't know if I cried cause I was on tech support for six hours. <laughs> that probably and, had something to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was just like, oh, like, and just, you know, I think, for me and like honestly that meant everything to me so um thank you for putting that in print that was like a really kind um thing to say yeah well, but, I, I definitely meant it yeah and, and i know and i know i think that's why and i think a lot of people i think especially in education um don't are actually are that person for a lot of people and don't get that recognition do you know what I mean? I think a lot mm -hmm. of times it's tough. Anyways, Mandy, I know that we've had John before, and um, but maybe some people here are not listening. Can you just share a little bit about who you are and uh, you know, kind of what your work is right now, just to share with everybody who's, who's who maybe doesn't know you right now? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I was a former elementary teacher and tech integrator and recently retired from the school district as a director of innovation and technology. And so um, the, the, I, the tech piece, I, I work a lot in um, with helping districts right now in particular move to um, online and virtual, uh, virtual work, um, starting up cyber programs and virtual programs. Um, and then my interest has been for the last few years in mental health. And so I have uh, specifically with educators, although I do address student mental health every now and then, I know that there are people kind of looking out for them. So I try to, to stick with the educators. And um, so right now in particular, those two areas have absolutely, well, it's almost like an app smash <laughs> of right. things together right. um, in order to support teachers right now. And, this situation so okay and, and what actually what I wanted to do and I think this is kind of the hope of this podcast because like I said um, you know a lot of people are probably struggling right now like I know that I'm having some rough days um, you know with my own mental health and just kind of uh, you know like your purpose right like a lot of people kind of what they used to do they're not doing right now and and then we we struggle uh, for whatever reason so you feel you lose purpose. So I actually started reading your book and this, so I'm reading the preface and this is what I was talking about, how it made me feel like it made me really think it made me, and I, I love books like that, that I'm like, okay, I can't, I can't read this right now. I got to take a step away and think about this. So right in the preface, you said this, um, <laughs> I didn't love every day of my job and I didn't love every task I was assigned, but I did love teaching. I love teaching so much that I did everything everyone asked of me. When I was able to take on more and do it well, I was asked to do more and I did it because I knew it was good for the students, even though I was tired and crabby with my own family when I got home. When people said, you're going to get burnt out, I said, that's impossible. You can't get burnt out doing something you love, but you can. Too much of anything is still too much. So there are like so many things just in that one part that really sat with me because I think of myself as a teacher. I think of myself when I was an administrator. 
I think of myself, you know, as, as a parent and the, the one, and I, I'm, we're going to break this down. So one of the things that I was very cognizant of doing was not punishing people that were doing a great job by actually making them do more work. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think that's one of the things that when we know, and I think a lot of times I, I thought, I think a lot about first year teachers and people new to the profession, a mm-hmm. lot of times, you know, they, we say they leave, you know, within five years, but a lot of times, and maybe this is more of a Canada thing than a U.S. thing, new teacher mm-hmm. comes in uh, because sports coaching is volunteer. Then we like, they volunteer for everything. Mm-hmm. They're just getting settled. Uh, they're doing all this stuff and then they're exhausted and they're like, is this, is this, is this what this is going to be like? And then eventually they stop doing those things for whatever reason, because it's just so overwhelming. I know that I, I was coaching all year round when I first started teaching volunteer, uh, cause you don't get paid in Canada for doing it. So like talk about that part from your perspective of vote, like just that one part about how we, sometimes we punish people for doing a great job. Yeah. So it's, I think from the standpoint of leadership, um, You know, we have, when you are a school leader, you are a district leader, you know who your go-to people are. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like, you know who they are. You know that when you go to them and you say, hey, can you do this? Or, you know, "Um, hey, will you take this on? You know that they're going to do it. They're going to do it well. They're going to do it timely and with enthusiasm, right? Like, you know who those people are. And so you go to them and you do that and then you do it again and then you do it again and you do it again. And what that happens, what happens with engagement is what you're actually saying is I have teachers who are engaged and I'm going to utilize them. I also have teachers who are not engaged and I'm just going to ignore them because I'm not really sure what they would do with this information. And so you essentially start working the engaged teacher into a burnout scenario because you're using them over and over. And it, it, it sort of feels um, when I was a when I was a teacher, I had a couple students I could go to who I knew that I could count on them to double check the job board to make sure it was done on a Monday morning, you know, or something right. to that effect. It's, it's sort of the same idea. Um, you want your good people doing the best things, but then within that, you're also actually ignoring the people who are disengaged and you're burning out your best people. And so. So what do you so what do you do then? Okay, and like I think the the question is. So what about the people that are disengaged? Like, how do you get them, you know, that are currently in that space where, you know, they might not be coming through on stuff. So, because it seems like, hey, let's not ask those people to do, like the people that are doing, you know, going to the ends of the earth to do more because it's gonna eventually burn them out. But Mm -hmm. then we still got that stuff to do. Yeah. So then how how do you do that in an effective way to spread that around? Yeah. So I get asked this all the time, like what can administrators do to help teacher engagement? And um, so one of the things that um, one of the things that is challenging about teacher disengagement is that it takes uh, internal uh, self-reflection in order to um, really be able to notice where you are on the continuum because there is a continuum, you know, right. you're not just engaged or disengaged um, and to notice where you are and then figure out how you can get from that spot into engaged. With administrators, because it is sort of an internal battle, a decision somebody has to make, um, they're limited in what they can actually do to make that happen. Um, one thing is um, make sure that you're holding the right, of pe- the right people accountable. Um, so that would be don't uh, sort of the idea of placing some sort of compliance on the whole staff because one or two people aren't doing something. Actually talk to those people because they're probably your more disengaged teachers. Mm-hmm. Um, But then from from that standpoint, you know, offer a lot of modeling. Uh, If you are asking teachers to do self-care, you need to participate in self-care too. Um, Never ever, I've seen self-care put out on teachers as a compliance measure. Report back to me what you're doing on self-care. Never do that. That's not going to help. Um, you can do things like as a district administration, making sure that, and we talked about this in the last podcast, making sure you're checking, um, your district insurance. Mm -hmm. Can people get help? How do they get help? How do they do it easily? You know, so there are a few practical things that you can do. Um, start working on, start working on the climate and culture of your school. You know, it, it's probably goes without saying that the more disengaged people you have, the more negative your climate 
is going to be in your school. So how can you start doing things to improve the climate of your school so that they have a chance of feeling like they can re-engage again? So there's a few things that administrators can do, but it really does come from inside the teacher in order to be able to do it. And I think like, as I'm listening to you, one of the things I was very cognizant of as an administrator, because I know I hate it as a teacher, was to never um, basically discipline the whole because of a few. Sure. Right. And, you know, someone saying like, hey, we're all do and I hate when teachers do it to students. Right. Like yeah, right. some of you did something. And mm -hmm. the, the people that usually are upset are the ones who didn't do anything because mm -hmm. they're like, is that me? Right. Mm -hmm. Am I am I doing this? Like and the ones who did are like, what do I care? Right. right. You know, like, I think that is a reality. And I also see it on to be honest you social media right everyone's like if oh if you're this then all and everyone's like is that me are you talking about me mm -hmm. and they start to internalize it and then we start to feel bad or whatever mm -hmm. as opposed to just just talk to the person just mm -hmm. talk to the person and that's part of the hey if you don't like it in an administration if you can't actually it's not about holding a account it's about having a conversation like with that person mm -hmm. uh, because i think sometimes you overwhelm the people in that like that are actually doing going above and beyond for something they haven't done right yeah absolutely so the the next part i want to talk to you just in this preface and we're going to talk about i want to ask you a couple other things too. and manny and i we wanted to keep this short uh so we're just going to talk about a couple of things but i really want you to take um, a look at the book because i really am enjoying it um the like the people that are really like excited and love teaching and like are like filled with purpose and i like I, this is why it connects with me because i know that a lot of times your your biggest strength can also be the thing that kills you mm -hmm. right the yeah. thing that you yeah. are the most passionate about can actually blind you to other things and all of a sudden you know you're not as healthy as you once were you're not as mm -hmm. you know take care of your family and so kind of like how how, how can you recognize that of like when, you know, cause we want people to have purpose and meaning in their work, mm -hmm. but we also don't want them just to be, that's it. Mm -hmm. Right. So like, how do you recognize that and how do you deal with that? Yeah. So um, there's a lot in there. And I think, I think in the preface, it says something to the effect too, that, you know, um, the, the person who said the hardest part is getting started never woke up one day and found themselves completely disenchanted with the, you know, the, the profession they thought they loved. And that was, um, for me, that was a really, really hard day. That day that I realized that I was, I was manifesting my worst issues. Um, mm -hmm. I was the one who was doing that. And so um, I think that one of the parts that's important to that is, uh, figuring out what your purpose is people a lot of people don't know what their purpose is or what their core beliefs are or why they're even really doing something and and so you know it's it's more than understanding your why it's understanding what the foundation is of of what keeps you going and and so one of the first things i had to do is i had to find that and the reason that i say um when I say that you were the catalyst for my re-engagement, it was because of your keynote. And then um, subsequently you told me to start blogging and blogging did way more for me than just putting my ideas mm -hmm. out there, which is what I thought was the original point of it. Right? Like I thought, Oh, I've got to share with my PLN. Um, blogging helped me find and isolate what my true beliefs were. And when I added those up, it became my purpose. And so my purpose is supporting teachers so that they can best support students. So finding that purpose and then understanding that there are going to be times that you start sliding back on the engagement scale and, and almost doing what would be like a, sort of a professional body scan of figuring out how does that feel? And when that starts to happen, what strategies can I use to make sure that my engagement stays back there? I find that for me, I, and I don't know, like, I, I don't know if it's kind of on the same lines. When we talk about blogging, it's almost like a therapy for me. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like I have these things stuck in me and it's, that's a release, right? I yeah. feel that. Um, and sometimes I just straight up write like, Hey, I'm, I'm writing to, to learn, not to share my learning. Like I'm actually mm -hmm. writing to get 
stuff out there um, and, and take con- connection. And one of the things that um, you wrote, and I don't have the exact statement, but it reminded me of something I heard um, from Will, uh, Will Smith, right? Fresh Prince Will Smith mm-hmm. was um, basically along the lines of you might not be the cause of the issue, but you also, but you have the responsibility. Oh, really? I totally said that in the book. It's not those exact words, but uh, yeah, I think. Okay. So like, okay, just because I I read it and like, I like sometimes, you know, like if something bad happens to you by someone else, Mm -hmm. there, they, that person's probably not going to fix it for you. Was that what you're saying there? Like, because I think sometimes we, we want that, you know, we want that person that caused that or that situation that caused that. But ultimately at the end of the day, and I think you said something about like along the lines of like it, it does fall into our responsibility to, 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 to solve that. Or am I yeah. totally reading that wrong? Nope. You are correct. So, um, yeah. And it, it comes along with the idea of sometimes you have to learn to forgive people who are never going to say they're sorry, you know, like, it, it, like really forgiving people and moving on past that. And if you, if you look at reasons why you're, why people are disengaged, a lot of them come down to other people. And so, you know, understanding that forgiveness is really about allowing somebody to not have so much control over your life. Mm -hmm. Um, not letting them off the hook for something that's really not about them anymore. And then, uh, you know, subsequently, sometimes Mm -hmm. you have to, um, you know, you, you may not have been the cause of your issue or you may not be the cause of your, uh, your disengagement or your issue or your anxiety or your depression or whatever it is. You may not have been the cause, but it is still your responsibility to heal. And that was, that was the point that when I woke up that one day and I'm like, Oh my gosh, I totally, and there's a power in having, Mm -hmm. in, in having that control, you know, it doesn't feel so outside of your scope of ability when you know that you have control over that. Yeah, and I, I like when you're talking about this, I think about parts of my career. Um, I, I remember I was going to quit teaching. I hated it. And a lot of it was, was placed blame on like the situation that I was in was on that. And then when I look at some of the stuff too, I think uh, part of it is obviously saying, okay, that wasn't the best situation, but was I actually at my best there? Like what could I have done mm-hmm. differently in that situation to make better? And once, you, once I started to realize I'm okay, so now that I know this, that I could, mm-hmm. maybe it wouldn't have been much better, but mm-hmm. I actually can do something with this. What can I do moving forward? And I think that was a huge shift in my career was when mm-hmm. I started saying like, I am going to put a lot, of, I'm going to put this in my hands. I'm going to say like, no, I don't, because I, I want to show up in a way that I'm really proud of. And if I don't get that, at least I can say, well, you know what? I did an incredible job. I did this. And I put that responsibility on myself. And I think that was a huge shift for me because a lot of times it was like, uh, I'm not getting this thing, you know, for what I want in teaching. I'm not getting this. The situations, it's not me. It's the situation. And, mm-hmm. and really kind of stepping back and almost outside of yourself. Yep. Let's say, okay, if I was watching this, what could I have done differently to make this better? Yeah. And I think that changed a lot of things for me. Um, the the when you talk about you talk about these two terms and this is like the whole premise of, of the book is educator disengagement and educator engagement and the, as you said it's like a continuum can you just talk about those two terms specifically yeah absolutely so um when i started using the terms educator engagement and disengagement i noticed that there was a little uh like kind of rumbling in the teacher's heart of of irritation with those two because in the past they've been used uh, kind of synonymously for, are you paying attention in a PD? You know, and right. and that's not, I wanted to make sure that, that that is not at all where I was going with that. And so um, the, the way that they came about is I took um, education and kind of uh, put it together with the psychological definition of emotional engagement. And so um, I, I came up with the two, uh, the two, um, definitions and educator disengagement uh, I defined as the unintentional detaching which I think is really important of oneself from the emotional connection to the why behind education and teaching due to negative factors and or circumstances that feel out of one's control and we did just talk a little bit about how like you do have you do have elements of control so it's about taking that control back Um, this results in an other un otherwise uncharacteristically negative view of their efficacy self uh, jobs and potentially their personal selves. And um, 
And so when I had written The Fire Within, I talked a little bit about disengagement and had defined it as um, forgetting your why behind teaching, forgetting why you do that anymore. And it really was so much deeper than that. It needed a little bit more oomph, I guess, a little bit more, um, you know, definition. So that's why I, why I took that. So this is the last question I asked you. I know we're trying to keep this short or short yep. on time. So for, in North America, some people have already started. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there's some people are about to start. There's so much uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And like, neither of us are medical professionals, right? Mm -hmm. And we don't yep. know that stuff. And we're going to leave that to the people that make those decisions. Yep. But personally, if my own anxiety going into the year, and my own, like, this is a time where I think it can be really easy to, be, to get to that disengaged space. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give as people are entering that new year that they can do for themselves? Like, what can they control in that space as they're going sure. back? Because, like, I, I don't even want to say if they're going back face to face, if they're going back virtual. Like, every, like sure. every, everything can cause anxiety right now. Yeah. Right? Like, there's no, like, hey, this is perfect. This is exactly where we want to be. So, like, what, what, what would you give for uh, advice right now on that to get yeah. them engaged going into this, this new school year? So I think a lot of people start with self-care. I would say self-care is really important on a regular basis and that everybody should be doing it. Um, the issue is that self people use self-care as like the answer to everything. And so while I think that it needs, it definitely needs to be addressed um, and you need to make sure that you're finding the time to do those things. I, it's not the be all and end all. Um, what I actually would say is as you um, go into this coming year and you have all of these different feelings, uh, the best thing that you can do for yourself is learn to name them. And um, so, for example, I put out a blog post on overwhelm. What is overwhelm? And people were messaging me and responding with, oh, my gosh, this is totally what I'm feeling right now. Like, just knowing the name of it makes me feel so better, so much better. And, yeah, that's, that's the purpose of naming something. So you, you name the emotion. You have to sit with it. You can't get rid of it. You have to sit in it. And you have to let your body know that that is what you're feeling. And it's, it sounds very kind of uh, out there. And it's, it's really not. It's your, sometimes when you have feelings, your body doesn't know how to name them or to move past that. Uh, my, my own counselor always used to say, feel to heal. You have to feel to heal. And so you have to be able to name it. You have to be able to sit with it and acknowledge it. And then you have to be able to move on from that. And, and I, can't, I can't express enough how important naming things are and part of the part of the thing with reignite the flames part of my goal with that was to help people be able to name it i don't i don't want people to continue to call everything burnout because not everything is burnout sometimes sometimes disengagement comes from demoralization and sometimes disengagement comes from a personal adversity at home you're you know you are a, a teacher and you're um, your mother unexpectedly passes away from COVID. Okay. Uh, you know, like, like things like that, that's a personal adversity that actually has nothing to do with education whatsoever, but you are definitely pulling away from education in order to deal with these emotions over here. And so, um, you know, one of the things I wanted was just for people to be able to name what's happening so that they can start to move on from that. Well, if you haven't um, heard about it, I suggest reading at the flames. It's going to push you. It's going to, you know, as, especially as you go into the school year, man, you did a great job. I'm really enjoying it. And thanks for taking the time to uh, share this book. I know um, this is written with EduMatch books. Awesome, awesome company, uh, putting some really great stuff out there. And um, Mandy, thank you so much for your time. I actually, thanks just as one me. aside, one aside, I know you're not, are you into basketball? Are you a basketball person? I've only ever been to one basketball game. Right, right. And it was the Bucks. Just so you know, yeah. Toronto Raptors are going to win the championship again this year, and they're going to beat Milwaukee Bucks. I know you're in Wisconsin, so I wanted to end with a little trash talk. Yeah, you think so, huh? I'll send you the Bucks hat when they win. Okay, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. Okay. Yeah, Yanis is Greek, so... I love them. So I, yeah. I, like I, whoever wins between the two, I'll be happy with. But Maddie, thank you so much. Uh, everyone, uh, connect with Maddie. You'll see your details. I'll put a link. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, a link to the book. Awesome stuff. Maddie, you have a great day. Thanks for all you thank do. Thank you so much. And thanks to all the teachers listening. And 
Um, hopefully this can help you as you're entering into that new school year. So take care. Bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.